Hi, Steve. How are you going? Great. Looking forward to coming to Australia. Yeah, I'm looking forward to having you here. Um, so it's good to finally speak. And look, um, it's I've been interested in interviewing like a number of futurists and uh, for a while. And I've been especially yourself and Ben. I did Ben just a little while ago, and it's been great. Oh, great. So yeah, I, it's good to have the privilege to speak to you guys. Who spent so much time and energy and um, on these concepts of AI and the future of humanity and existential risks. Yeah. <laughs> so it's great. Now, um, so yeah, how are you anyway? Oh, doing great. That's We've good. got the uh, AGI conference coming up here at Google in, a, in about a week or so. Yeah. And so uh, I think there'll be some interesting discussions there. And then the uh, summit in uh, Australia, I think, will mm. be a really nice uh, event. I did have well. a look. I did have a look at the um, the AGI conference, and I think uh, um, there's a number of in Ben speaking, and yep. Peter Norvig is speaking, which is really yep. interesting. Yeah. Exactly. So what, what's his take on AGI these days? Ah, uh, you know, I'll be interested to hear his talk. Um, I think, you know, he's concerned with day-to-day -day developments at Google. And so I don't think they have a lot of time to be thinking about longer-term future things. But I don't know. He could surprise us. I'll, I'll be very interested to hear what he has to say. Well, yeah, maybe you can report back. Because um, I remember an interview. Or he, he spoke at the Singularity Summit in America a little while ago. Um, and that was kind of good. And in an interview, he said he doesn't see it just around the corner. He sees it as a, a long-term sort of uh, development. However, you know, everybody's uh, minds change over time, I guess. The more evidence you have, the better decisions you can make. Um, yeah. So anyway, can you tell me a little bit more about yourself um, and, you know, what why you got into building artificial intelligence and academic background and all that? Sure. Uh, ever since I was a kid, I've been really interested in the relationship between mind and matter and, uh, you know, really interested in how it is that we think, what is thought, you know, wh what's the, the best way for us to live our lives and how does that relate to the physical world? So I ended up as a student uh, studying, uh, actually I started interested in philosophy, but uh, uh, kind of didn't really, I liked philosophy's questions, I didn't really like their answers very much. And I liked mathematics' as answers, but I didn't really like their questions too much. And physics was sort of in between. So I ended up uh, studying both physics and math and uh, then ended up getting a PhD in, in physics from Berkeley. And uh, right when I finished uh, my PhD, a friend of mine had just started this company called Thinking Machines. And it had uh, Marvin Minsky and Richard Feynman, and, you know, an amazing array of, of people involved with it. And so, uh, and AI was felt very much more like on the frontier of where knowledge is now. Uh, in physics, it's pretty hard to make fundamental uh, dramatic changes where I think in AI it's, you know, wide open. And so I uh, decided to switch directions, um, worked at that company and then became a professor at the University of Illinois and then was uh, involved with a number of other uh, research institutes and then some startup companies and then started my own company out here in Silicon Valley uh, a few years back. and. Uh, Along the way, I've been very interested in machine learning, machine vision. My students and I have built uh, robotic systems that learn from images of themselves. They watch themselves in operation and sort of like a baby might discover how its arms work by watching them. Uh, we built systems that read lips. We built uh, systems that learn grammars from examples and uh, some of the search engine companies have used some of those ideas. And so wide range of systems and a, you know, a number of years ago, uh, began to get involved with the concept that um, AI systems might improve themselves. They might model their own behavior and uh, might sort of discover ways to make themselves work better. And it felt like a very powerful and important uh, new approach to doing artificial intelligence. And so I decided to focus on that. And we began to realize that there were social consequences for that kind of a system. And that, you know, after many stages of iteration, uh, you, may not, you may understand the system very well when you start, but after many stages of it improving itself, who knows what it's going to end up as. And so uh, we spent a fair amount of time analyzing the behavior of self-improving systems and finding ways to ensure that they behave in, in, in a positive ways for humanity. Hmm. Yeah, it's a very important thing. Um, and AI, it seems to be a very powerful tool so far it, it, this year has been wonderful um, for you know the popularity of AI we've had a 
you know, Ray Kurzweil making the front cover of Time magazine, for instance, and we've yep. had Watson beat the pants off the very best Jeopardy players, uh, your quiz show in the US, much like the sale of the century in Australia. <laughs> That's the big show in Australia? Oh, yeah, it used to be. Yeah, um, I guess right. there's other ones like how, uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I'd love to see how um, Watson would fare there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll get it running and, and I'll keep the profits <laughs> that's alright yeah I'll see if I can borrow it from IBM and, and enter it in as a contestant and, um, or maybe it can just whisper secrets into my ear while I'm playing and I'll walk away with a cool million and uh, put that towards the ethical development of artificial intelligence or something like that Right. <laughs> yeah, but a million's not going to do it, is it? <laughs> we need more like well, twenty or fifty you know, million. Ideas are not that expensive. Um, ideas are. In this field, you don't really need such huge hardware. I mean, you know, things like Watson, I think, uses a lot of hardware. But people can make a lot of progress on just ordinary computers, and it doesn't take much money to support somebody to come up with a better idea. So it's unlike, you know, particle physics or something. It's a field in which a small amount of money can actually be leveraged to a very big effect. That's right, yeah. So, actually, um, do you know what's going on behind uh, Watson? What 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 sort of um, AI architecture they're using there? I think, you know, I haven't looked at it in great detail, but what I read about it, it felt like they had combined a number of fairly standard, um, you know, uh, natural language systems. And uh, they, they just combined them with a lot of data and, uh, you know, some very clever ways of, of sewing them together. But I don't think there were any major new advances involved in it. They were just taking existing technologies and really using them effectively and showing what they could do. And so uh, I think it was a great triumph for uh, the development of the field. Do you think they'd be able to do something like Watson is today, um, let's say, 20 or 40 years back? You know, um, there's a computational power question. I don't, I'm not sure the computers were powerful enough back then. And I think a number of the algorithms, particularly the machine learning algorithms that they use, I think were not uh, at that stage that time ago, that, that long ago. But, you know, in principle, I think if they knew then what we know now, that they probably could have done it. And so it's one of these things where, um, you know, understanding makes a big difference. So we've developed a, um, a, a lot of new AI techniques. I mean, uh, what expert systems, I don't know if they're even termed as AI these days, but they've gone out of favor, but they were in big favor at one stage. Was, wasn't that correct? Yeah. You know, the, the field has undergone a number of uh, waves of interest. Uh, it was named back in 1959 by uh, John McCarthy, and uh, he went on to start the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab, and Marvin Minsky went on to start the uh, MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab, and they kind of typified the neat versus the scruffy approach. So uh, McCarthy really liked logical representations and using mathematics and proving programs correct, whereas Minsky was more excited by the idea of systems which self-organize and which learn and maybe you throw together uh, random collections of neurons and they're able to um, self-organize into something intelligent. And those two approaches have sort of uh, gone back and forth over the, over the time. Uh, in the early 70s, Minsky and Papert wrote this book where they showed that the most popular neural model at the time, something called a perceptron, was actually very limited in what it could compute. And a lot of people got very depressed by that. And I think that sort of uh, gave a push to the more logic-based representations. And during the 80s, the logic representations really, you know, flew high. There were languages like Prolog that did uh, logic programming. And the Japanese had what was called the fifth generation project, where they built these special machines that were devoted to doing logical inference. Instead of, you know, today's machines are measured in MIPS, millions of instructions per second. Back then, the exciting thing was LIPS, logical inferences per second. And there was a feeling in the United States that, oh my God, the Japanese are getting beyond, you know, moving beyond us, and you know, we really need to compete. And expert systems were, you know, the hot thing, and there were all these expert system companies that were springing up all over the place. And they kind of hit a brick wall in that their those systems tended to work very well for simple, small problems, but they didn't scale very well. And so in the mid '80s, there was, uh, you know, the cover of Business Week said, "AI, the emperor has no clothes," mm -hmm. and there was a. Sometimes they call it the AI winter, where people felt like, oh, this is all a bunch of hype. It's not going to really work. And the other approach, the approach based on learning and on modeling neural, uh, neural networks, sort of started gaining speed. 
people discovered ways to, to deal with multiple layers of neurons moving beyond the perceptron, the old model from the 60s. Uh, and there was something called back propagation, which allowed um, credit to be assigned to uh, neurons in a complicated network so that you could adapt and change a complicated network to learn some behavior. And people started getting really great results. And so the learning side of things really took off. And in the 90s, people were building neural nets to you know, recognize speech, to uh, read, do optical character recognition, and making you know, real advances in those fairly well-defined narrow tasks. And so the, the kind of learning approach sort of uh, took over from the logic approach. And my own feeling is that what we really need is a synthesis of the two. Uh, as a student, I studied uh, theorem proving with uh, McCarthy. And uh, when I later worked at Thinking Machines, I worked with um, Marvin Minsky and kind of got the feeling of uh, some of his approaches. And so in my, my own work, I, I believe that the, the, the neat and the scruffy has to come together. And I think that's, uh, that's where real advances are going to come from. What sorts of intelligence would you say would be easily modeled in uh, using the scruffy approach and the neat approach? Well, I mean, today's neural networks um, are fairly rough models of biological neural networks. And nonetheless, they can do some, some uh, very powerful tasks. What they're not good at, the scruffy approach is not very good at representing anything with complicated semantics. So if you imagine a scene like, you know, uh, somebody opens the front door and two cats run in and they start having a fight in the middle of the floor and then a dog comes and they both get scared and jump on the, on the table. Um, that's something that I could describe in a few sentences. You get an image in your head of what that is. No neural net today could even represent the pieces of that. Now, you could build a neural net, maybe, which can distinguish a dog from a cat. Um, you train it. You give it lots of pictures of dogs, lots of pictures of cats, and it can figure out what features in an image might distinguish those two. And so uh, today's neural nets, at least the way most people have explored them, are much better at very um, narrow, confined tasks, but they're able to use a lot of examples to learn. But they, they haven't generalized very well yet to representing complex semantics. Logical systems, on the other hand, uh, can potentially represent the story I just gave in, in a you know, really easy way. Um, but they, till now, they haven't been very good at dealing with fuzzy information, with probabilistic information. And so to, to really integrate real world knowledge, say, gotten from a TV camera and real world manipulation, say, of a robot, together with the kind of logical understanding that you need to you know, build up models for language, uh, I think you really need to combine the two approaches. Hmm. Okay, interesting. So the landscape of AI has obviously changed. Um, I guess if you were to if you were to just tell somebody um, in a in a you know a one minute sort of uh, description, how has the landscape changed since uh, nineteen or sixty or fifty years ago to what it is today in AI? I think the first big thing that happened was. You know, when, when it was first invented, you know, the name, it was named in 1959, though people were thinking about it. Von Neumann and Turing certainly had ideas about how to use computers to mimic the human mind. People didn't realize how hard a problem it was. And so, uh, for instance, I think um, one of, you know, Minsky thought that machine vision would be a summer project for one of his master's students. And mm -hmm. uh, he had a student which, who did, you know, many of the great advances in machine vision, the things that we still use today, came from his master's thesis, um, <laughs> but much harder problem than, than they realized. And it's still, you know, the, the full, you know, um, uh, visual recognition has gotten a lot better. Systems to recognize faces are now starting to be used, for better or worse, around the, the planet. Um, but the full understanding of what a 3D scene I is about, um, systems are still pretty, you know, not nearly as good as people are at that. And so that task, even though it's fairly well defined, you know, we, we understand how to do graphics very well. You know, g given a model of a scene um, and artificial, you know, uh, wh where the lights are and what the materials, the objects are made of, you can make a 3D movie that's almost indistinguishable from a real movie. And so we've got graphics down very well. And so you would think that machine vision is just the inverse of that, right? It's just find me the set of objects that make the image look like this. And yet um, we're, we're still, you know, it's still a ways off. The, the systems are getting better, but they're still not, uh, not fully functional. Um, and so the early ideas were that that kind of thing would just happen very, very quickly. And it's taken a lot longer than they imagined. 
Uh, other things like playing chess, which seemed like a very difficult intellectual challenge, it's hard for people to do, have turned out to not be so hard to do on machine. And so, uh, you know, computers beat the world champion uh, chess player uh, quite some time ago using That's um, fair, yeah, uh, using using fairly pedestrian techniques. So it was really just the compute power in Big Blue that allowed it to do the, the searches deep enough to, to, to go be, be able to go further than the way that the human did. Uh, of course, the machines, that, the, the chess playing machines we have today really don't play chess the way people do. Um, people look for patterns and they, they understand the game in a way that, that, um, that Big Blue does not. And so I think there's still room to improve um, the way that chess is played, even if the systems are, are now powerful enough to beat people. Yeah, it's, it seems a lot easier to predict um, what uh, you know, computing power increases, but in terms of algorithmic development and, and um, sort of breakthroughs, insights into uh, you know new inventions, that's a lot harder, isn't it? But absolutely, well, um, a lot of the people who are trying to put dates on you know when are these things likely to happen, um, it's very difficult to say when a new insight is going to come because you know it could happen tomorrow or it might not come for a hundred years. Um, on the other hand, the approaches which are based on the steady advancement of computing power and um, a lot of people are trying to build systems that model and mimic um, biological systems. And so um, the holy grail would be to build a, a computer system which actually simulated the operation of the human brain. And right now, computers are not powerful enough to do that and we don't have the neurophysiological data to enable that to happen. But both of those technologies, we can we can see where, where uh, computer technology is going, and we can see where the ability to uh, measure the firing of neurons and also the interconnectivity pattern of brains, um, both of those are on you know very steady technological advancement, and so the best predictions seem to be somewhere around 2030, we'll have both the compute power and the neurophysiological understanding to build uh, precise uh, models of a human brain running on a, on a piece of hardware. Interesting. Well, as Popper, I think it was Popper who says, we cannot know today what we'll discover tomorrow. Yeah, um, that's a great it, quote. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think what Kurzweil is, that's even earlier than what Kurzweil says. He, I think, he didn't he say something like 2039 for the brain to be simulated in a computer and then 2045 for there to be a singularity. I'm not up on his latest predictions. Yeah. So my memory was that it was 2030 for a single brain and okay. maybe 2039 for all of humanity, something mm. like that. Yeah. Um, all and of also <laughs> the economic forces that are going to get unleashed. You know, once these systems start working, um, pe the pace of progress is not going to go at the current pace. Companies uh -huh. are going to sort of start set sitting up and saying, oh my God, look at what we could do with this. And huge amounts of uh, money is going to start pouring into this kind of work. So things could really speed up as they become clearer. It's interesting. I mean, the v people probably do value intelligence, but they don't value it an, like uh, enough. I mean, it's not a commodity that they uh, they that they have talent and and people are the talent now. But if you look at what differentiated the human species within the animal kingdom. It wasn't, you know, winning at biting matches, um, you know, running fast, flying, flapping arms, or swimming. It was the power of intellect or the power of ideas, as way calls it. Um, so it was you know, our intelligence that really defined us. And of exactly. course, you know, uh, we had the right shaped hands to be able to manipulate the environment. But it, I, you know, the the whole tool making and um, offloading cognition onto the environment, as Werner Vinci likes to say. Um, sort of, to me, seem to have some sort of feedback loop into the evolution of the species. Um, Absolutely. You know, and I it's think interesting. I mean, I, I think it fits also in with cultural evolution, where hmm. we were able to, you know, build on the advances that other people did. So each person didn't have to develop everything from scratch. A culture got built where, you know, people taught other people how to carve the right stone axe, you know, and so technology could, could then begin to build on itself. And I think with the internet, we're kind of seeing the development of, some people are calling it the global brain or the global mind, uh, something like Wikipedia. No individual could have written Wikipedia. It's a sort of joint effort from people all around the world. 
that's really enabling, you know, now a young person trying to understand how things work. You can look everything up in Wikipedia and actually get a pretty good understanding of the current state of the art in many sciences. And so it's an amazing tool, really, really valuable and, and wonderful. And um, most often than not, the, um, the quality of information on Wikipedia is pretty good. Um, I don't know how they uh, inferred that the Wikipedia was supposed to, was supposed to be better than um, previously dedicated written encyclopedias, uh, like the Botanica. But um, I've heard that said that Wikipedia has better quality information than Botanica ever did. Is that is that correct? Or you know, I think it is. I, you know, I was totally. Um, uh, I, I found Wikipedia totally unexpected. If you you know. You had told me the model that they were going to use, that people don't get credit, that anybody can edit anything, I would have thought, eh, it's not going to work. But it remarkably formed into a kind of ecosystem where uh, when people put, you know, uh, uh, incorrect information or they, you know, put garbage in there, very quickly other people, you know, find it in their heart to kind of monitor those pages and really keep it, keep it tight. And experts in any special area will look in Wikipedia about their area, and if it's not saying the right thing, they feel compelled to fix it up. Whereas in Britannica, uh, Britannica, I think, had a wonderful model where they would hire experts in a field to write the definitive article. The trouble is that's, you know, they got one guy to write that, and the, the pace of change would be very, very slow. In Wikipedia, you get eyes from all over the planet working on it. And, you know, sometimes I read an article and there's things which are wrong, and I'll just get in there and change it. And so... Um, and I, lots of my friends do the same thing, and so I think it sort of incrementally uh, I improves itself to the point where now many of those articles are, are uh, you know, really excellent surveys of the current state of the art. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good, I mean, and, a lot, and it does, I think, attract a lot of smart people. The, people totally. the type of people who are more interested in updating and correcting information are probably, you know, um, smarter than the average, I'd say. Um, and yeah. it, so, so it's, it does attract the right sorts of people, it seems, that model, which is important. And you could kind of see the Wikipedia together with the people that use it as forming a new kind of mind. That's, that's a kind of artificial mm -hmm. intelligence already. It, Wikipedia is sort of a cyborg, you know, it's a sort of a blending of a bunch of human minds together with this, um, you know, electronic artifact that together are doing something that, that the individual people couldn't do. And even the people as a group without the Wikipedia there uh, couldn't get to the same place, and so it's an it's a simple, but it's an enabling technology that allows the collection and the uh, building up of knowledge uh, in a way that's that's uniquely new. And I think it's a mm. hint of what's going to come as we get some real intelligence in in the hardware in the in the machine side of things. Uh, that I think there'll be, be a, a similar kind of uh, synergy between the the human mind and the uh, machine minds. Could you parallel that to something like? Uh, Douglas Hofstadter's um, Ant Hill, whatever she was called, I forget now. Ant Hill, yeah. 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 yeah, I thought that there was a brilliant uh, story from his book, uh, Gertel Escher Bach, mm. uh, in which the individual ant is not so smart, but the Ant Hill has a personality and a mind and does all kinds of things. And at the end of the story, a rainstorm you know, right. washes away the, the thing and it reorganizes, <laughs> but it's a different, different mind, it's a different personality. It's a, uh, I, I found that story very yeah. inspiring, and yeah. I've recently seen, uh, uh, there's a, a researcher at, at Stanford, uh, Deborah Gordon, I think is her name, who's written several books on um, ant hill behavior, and it's not so far from the truth. You know, individual ants are not very smart, and yet the behaviors of the ant hill, like if it starts to rain, they know how to build little protective things for their hills, and mm. they send out little foragers, which are kind of like tentacles to reach out and find out where the food is, and they have to make, you know, the ant hill as a whole makes decisions about, you know, when to reproduce, how many of each type of ant that it needs, and how to deploy its resources. It acts as a very uh, intelligent brain. And so uh, I think those uh, social insect species are a great example to look at because we can really understand the way the communication paths are working inside those systems. And I think they give us insight into how the human brain is working because, you know, our brain they're also made of a bunch of neurons. Individual neurons are not very smart, and yet the connectivity pattern and the way that they work together uh, leads to a kind of emergent intelligence, which is the human intelligence. Yeah, it's, uh, it is uh, this emergent phenomenon. Um, it's going to be more interesting when we all start really plugging into the internet. I mean, when we when augmented reality, for instance, 
um, gets very mature and it feeds back into our social systems when we're walking around like with goggles or some form of um, layer over our eyes that um, see the world but with metadata uh, pasted over the top you know we might get spam which slaps us over the face uh, when we're walking down the street but we'll build mechanisms to sort of blur that out and blur the people we don't like out and and um, you know <laughs> try and uh, filter out some of the parts of reality that we don't want which is a another whole discussion um, but I guess yeah, we'll I think be that starts leading into the ethical issues and the way that society is going to be transformed by these technologies. Yeah. I mean, not only, like you're describing mostly what you get coming in, but there's also the face that you put out going out. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll be able to create avatars that project something different than your own, you know, uh, physical features or your own personality. And that is likely to dramatically so change the form of human interaction. And is it in a good way or a bad way? I don't know. I mean, I think that's where we have to start doing a lot of thinking about where where we want to end up. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's it's hard to put values on these things before we even try them. And um, I guess it's not really the technologies which have the value, which um, have the good or bad value. It's just how we end up using them. Um, and yeah. I hope we can really find uh, safe ways and um, ethical ways to deploy the technologies so that the likelihood of there being a beneficial outcome is increased. Exactly. Yeah, I think the technology is really um, just a vehicle whereby humanity can express uh, its deepest values. It, it express, you know, it's a new way to express the human spirit uh, mm -hmm. in, in a much larger stage. And we can express both the, you know, the best aspects of humanity and the worst aspects. And so, uh, the technology itself is amoral. Yeah, agreed. Um.